Imagine you're watching like three couples arguing as you sip your tea. Eventually protective services takes away their children. You are like the only person that signed up for foster care. So the authorities drop off like eight kids at your doorstep. Oh, and you're kind of like on welfare, even though you're a doctor. Yeah, that's basically Jordan. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Welcome to the Referee of the Middle East. Jordan is interesting because it operates very differently from all the other Middle Eastern countries in so many ways. Oh, is that like my cue to make a pun? Uh, let's Jord begin this episode. Ugh. Okay, so I'm gonna be honest. Before writing the script of this episode, all I really knew about Jordan was Petra and Fatet. That stuff Ismail made me try when I visited Saudi Arabia. But after talking to you Jordanian geography peeps, I have to say I'm pretty excited to make this episode. First of all, Jordan is located in the Middle East, bordered by four other countries, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, and Israel, as well as the Palestinian West Bank areas along the Jordan River. And they have a small coast along the Gulf of Aqaba, named after the town that borders it, right across the narrow coast of Israel's Eliat. The country is divided into 12 governorates, split into North, Central, and South regions. And the capital and largest city is Amman, located in the center, which which by the way was the same place as the ancient city of Philadelphia when the Greeks ruled over it, making it one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. The largest cities after Amman are Zarqa and Irbid, with the busiest airports being the two international ones, Amman Queen Alia International and Aqaba's King Hussein International, with Amman Civil Airport taking in third place. Most of Jordan's current borders were pretty much the byproduct of European colonialism back when it was under the British as the Emirate of Transjordan. The only difference is that now the border extends with the Israeli-controlled disputed Golan Heights area with the Yarmouk River as well as with Syria, and Iraq took a small chunk of the eastern border and built the Ruwashid Air Base, which is now abandoned and being reclaimed by the desert once again. Hey, there's a challenge for you extreme globetrotters. See if you can find a way to trek out to this place. Even though Jordan and Saudi Arabia have an open border policy, back in the 60s they did a little bit of land swapping. The border is totally demarcated with bold trenches, literally cutting through rock canyons and dry desert valleys. With Syria, it's a little complicated. In the populated areas, the borders are bold. They even have a free joint industrial zone shared between the two. But the further east you go into the Syrian desert, Desert, the border just kind of disappears and is left for anyone crazy enough to wander into the desolate no man's land to, I guess, cross if they want to. But yeah, you gotta be crazy to do that. The vast majority of people live in the Northwest due to its more suitable climate and arable land. Otherwise, the cool thing is that Jordan actually has a ton of historical background, lots of places being preserved in places of interest, such as Jarash, Ajloun, Montreal, the Karak Castles, the Roman Amphitheater, Amman Citadel, Ad Deir, the Mayin Hot Springs, the Madaba Map Church, Qasr Amra, Um Arras Umayyad Palace, the Sikh rock walls, the Nymphaeum, the temples of Hercules and Ducheres, the Ark of Hadrian, Mount Nebo, where Moses is supposedly buried, and the crowning landmark, Petra, which is one of the seven wonders of the modern world. Now, from that list, you can probably tell that Jordan has quite a unique backstory, and it just gets more and more interesting as you move along. Speaking of moving along... <laughs> Now here's where things get a little difficult. Although beautiful sites abound, in terms of resources, Jordan kind of doesn't really have much going for them. First of all, Jordan lies at the crossroads between three continents in the easternmost parts of the region known as the Levant, or the areas closest to the Mediterranean in the Middle East. The country is basically divided into three main regions, north, south, and west. The majority of the land lies on a plateau within the Syrian and Arabian deserts, flanking the east and south, loaded with dry basins and riverbeds that collect water in seasonal winter rains, which evaporate shortly after. Like seriously, if you look at the satellite images of Jordan, the entire desert is like scribbled with infinite amounts of dried up drainage network estuaries, indicating that at one point Jordan had a lot of water. Otherwise, in the west you have the Jordanian highlands where you can find the highest peak Jabal Um Ad-Dami, located in Jordan's top natural landmark, the famous world heritage site Wadi Rum, which is basically Mars on Earth. No, seriously, they even filmed The Martian in this desert. Which, by the way, have you guys noticed Matt Damon always makes movie posters with text over his face? Like, what's up with that dude? Can you like maybe establish more of a context or setting? Sorry, off topic. Moving on. The highlands go all all the way up to the largest lake, the Dead Sea, the lowest point on Earth, up to nine times saltier than any ocean, shared with Israel, which is fed into the longest river, the Jordan River, which completes the rest of the western border. The only lush and arable land that they have is in the northwest, just along the tri-point of Israel and the Israeli-controlled disputed Golan Heights area and Syria. This is the only area where you can find forests, grasses, farms, and sufficient precipitation in the form of both rain and, yes, even snow. Now here's the unfortunate aspect. Jordan is one of the three least oil-producing countries in the Middle East, the other two being Israel and Lebanon. Technically, you could also include Afghanistan and Cyprus to this list if you consider them Middle East, but eh, up to you. Anyway, although oil shale deposits do exist in certain spots across the desert, it is far from being anything from a significant economic commodity that they can depend on, and to this day, most of the oil is imported from their neighbors. Add on top of that, the fact that Jordan is consistently ranked as one of the driest countries in the planet with only about 145 cubic meters of water per capita annually, it's so dry that most of the wild mammals have become locally extinct or are reduced to remnant populations, including the national animal 
animal, the Arabian Oryx, which had to be reintroduced through a breeding program. Otherwise, birds and reptiles are the only main wildlife species you'll probably see, including the national bird, the Sinai Rose Finch. Only about 7% of the land is arable on 20% of the land that receives more than 200 millimeters of rain a year, the bare minimum required for rain-fed agriculture. Remember that, guys, the 200 millimeter rule. If you weren't paying attention, too late, you missed it, haha. <laughs> With whatever little farmland they do have, they grow everything possible from olives to wheat, citrus, melons, tomatoes, which they use in their food. Most Jordanian food follows the typical pan-Arab format. However, some unique Jordanian specialties might include things like maklube, frike, the Bedouin-style zarb. Although it's more of a Palestinian thing, kanafe is popular, and it's seriously like the most amazing dessert I ever got to taste when I was in the Emirates. Thanks, Basil, for opening my eyes to the glory. And the national dish, mansaf, which can sometimes cost so much when people try to order it for parties and weddings that people actually have been known to take out mortgages just to pay for it. Also, alcohol is totally legal in Jordan, so yeah, just heads up. Putting all of that into perspective, you can probably understand why Jordanians typically say that tourism is their oil. They are kind of dependent on outside sources for resources. And especially since an influx of visitors have been putting a pressure and demand for more food and changing the game up for the past half century. Who am I referring to? Well, find out in about three, two, one. Have you ever had like a hangout spot in your neighborhood that everybody just kind of goes to because they know it's kind of like a place of solace? Yeah, that's kind of basically what Jordan is to the Middle East. First of all, Jordan has about 10 million people and was ranked the top refugee country by Amnesty International. The country is made up of mostly Arabs at 98%. However, amongst these Arabs, it's estimated that about a third are non-citizen refugees with illegal status. However, some say that it could be up to 60%. However, it's hard to tell because no specific data reports exist and lots of intermarrying happens. Anyway, the remainder is mostly a small minority of Chechens Circassians and Armenians. They also use the Jordanian dinar as their currency. They use the type C, D, F, G, and J plug outlets. Yeah, I've been to the Middle East. It's a weird system. And they drive on the right side of the road. Back to the refugee thing. Basically, since the Six Day War thing that we already discussed in the Israel episode, Palestinians mostly fled to Jordan as well as a few other places in the Arab countries like Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and Iraq. The numbers are kind of hard to estimate, but somewhere around 3 million Palestinians are estimated to reside in Jordan with about 2.1 million registered. Add on top of that, about another 1.4 million or so Syrians that have just entered entered into Jordan after all the recent conflicts involving Bashar al-Assad and ISIS. This means that Jordan, which is already a water and resource scarce country, has to provide a lot for people that they did not see coming. Keep in mind though, not all Jordanians are Arab. Like mentioned before, there are some noticeable Armenian, Chechen, and Circassian communities that live relatively peacefully amongst them. Most of you probably already know what an Armenian is, but however, for those of you that don't know, Chechen and Circassians are two different people groups that originate in areas of what is now Southern Russia, located just above the Caucasus countries like Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Chechens are predominantly Muslim, whereas Circassians are kind of like a mix between Christians and Muslims. At about 5% of the population, the majority of Christians in Jordan are Eastern Orthodox, and churches can be found in large cities. Christians even make up nine seats in their parliament, and some hold high positions in other public sector jobs like in the military and ambassadors. Speaking of which, in the quickest way I can summarize the history of Jordan, Bronze Age kingdoms of Amen, Moab, and Edom, Nabataeans, Babylonians, Alexander the Great, the Rashidun and Umayyad Caliphates, Ottoman Empire, Great Arab Revolt, End of Turkish Control, Beginning of British Control, Border is redrawn, Hashemites take over, Welcome Abdullah the First, Independence in 1946, 1948 War and Annexation of the West Bank, Influx of Palestinian Refugees, Assassination of King Abdullah the First, Failed Jordan Iraq Union in 1958, PLO forms in Jordan, Civil War and Black September in 1970, PLO leaves Jordan, Jordan Israel Peace Treaty signed in 1991, Arab Spring protests in 2011 and 2013, and here we are today. Make of it what you will, but Jordan is often touted by both neighbors and abroad for being one of the safest countries to visit in the Middle East. This is partially not only because of their historical tourism, but also medical tourism industry. The World Bank consistently ranks Jordan in the top five medical tourism destinations in the Middle East and North Africa, which alone makes about $1 billion in annual revenue. The sad thing though is that after the Arab Spring and destabilization around their neighbors, tourism has dropped about 70% between 2010 and 2015. Recently though, things have been kind of slowly picking back up. Otherwise, some famous people of Jordanian descent might include Omar al Abdalat, Queen Rania of Jordan, Amir Dib, Muat al Kasaspe, Diana Corazon, Zade Dirani, Mustafa Wah. B. Al Tal, Jamil Al As, Haider Mahmoud, Maiz Hamdan, Sohir Al Oda, Ali bin Hussein, and of course the royal family is actually a huge hit. Most people actually like King Abdullah II. He actually served in the British Army, Jordanian Special Forces, and as a Cobra helicopter pilot. His wife Queen Rania is super popular too, as she has done a lot of advocacy work in the fields of education and health. Also, you know, he and his family claim to be 41st generation direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, so yeah, they got that going for them. Well, as you can probably see by now, Jordan has a lot of people that they kind of have to deal with internally, but they also do a lot of international outreach as well, which means we gotta finish this video with one more segment, the... 
Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to go where you can see troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. And to the Arab world, that's Jordan. First of all, the US and UK still have close ties. The biggest US embassy in the Middle East is in Amman and they are the second largest receiver of aid after Israel. King Abdullah II's mother was British and many of the royal family has studied abroad in the UK. As a founding member of the Arab League, they of course, no shocker, get along with most of their fellow Arabs. Egypt is a close friend. The majority of foreign workers come from there and Iraq supplies Jordan with most of their fuel needs. Saudi Arabia treats Jordan kind of like a sidekick, knowing that they will always trust them and know that they can be loyal. Whereas the UAE is like Saudi Arabia's hot, rich sister that Jordan totally has a crush on. So he hopes to get close to her by befriending Saudi Arabia. However, their best friend would probably be Palestine. Jordan is pretty much the only country in the Middle East in which Palestinian refugees have a real chance at integrating and becoming Jordanian citizens, which unfortunately isn't really the case with other countries with Palestinian refugees. Jordan once took over the West Bank until the Six Day War, and since then Palestinians have been supported and intermarrying Jordanians for decades, like the Queen. In conclusion, if the Middle East was a body, Jordan would kind of be like the liver, acting as like a safety net filtration system surrounded by drama on every side, and it's their job to kind of process and reorganize everything with whatever little resources they have left. Stay tuned, Kazakhstan is coming up next.